Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, it's great to be here with Captain Charles Moore. Captain Moore was sailing from California to Hawaii in 1997 when he discovered the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, a large area of the North Pacific where currents concentrate ocean debris. After seeing this area firsthand, he knew he needed to bring what he saw to the attention of the world. In 1999, he sailed out to the garbage patch again, this time to do a scientific study on how much plastic was present. Since then, he's gone back to the garbage patch five times over the last 20 years, studying what seems to be an ever increasing amount of plastic. In 1999, Captain Moore founded the Algalita Marine Research and Education Foundation, whose mission is to educate and inspire the next generation of visionaries to take action through developing solutions to lessen plastics in the environment and believe in a better future. Now Captain Moore has founded another nonprofit, the Moore Institute for Plastic Pollution Research, whose focus will be on the growing microplastic research field. I first met Captain Moore in October of 2019. I was invited to be in an exhibition at Angels Gate Cultural Center in San Pedro, and my project, Fathom, addressed the urgent problems of sea level rise and ocean plastic pollution in a series of individual sculptures that were presented as an installation. The sculptures were made of salvaged ocean trash and I was working with the Surfrider Foundation to procure materials. Amy Erickson, director of Angels Gate, contacted Captain Moore about my project and it turns out he had just returned from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch a few days before and was willing to co contribute some of his famous trash to my project. I jumped in my car and went to Long Beach to pick it up. It was amazing to meet the captain and see his research vessel, the Algita, and here we are. I was fortunate enough to spend a couple of hours with him at that time and hear some wonderful stories. Captain Moore donated some of his famous plastic garbage to my project and through a series of workshops with members of the Angels Gate community, this installation, Fathom, was created. Can we have the Fathom image, please? There it is. Yep. And there will also be a link to, there's a video about the project and Emily uh, will provide a link to the video in the chat. The captain graciously agreed to speak at the exhibition opening and blew people away with his witty and devastating presentation covering many things we had never thought about before. He thinks artists can play an important role in addressing ocean plastic pollution. And I would now like to read a brief quote from his book, Plastic Ocean, about that role. Forward-thinking individuals and small groups have been the first to daringly disengage from the lifestyle driven by plastic junk. Artists are often at the forefront because they seize on waste plastic as an easily available material to play with. Consciously or unconsciously, their works abstract from and thereby break with the status quo's oppressive pseudo prosperity based on gadgetry. In this way, they are prying open a space where the revisioning of plastic can commence." End quote. Captain Moore and his research have deeply inspired and influenced me and my visual art practice. My current body of work, a series of sculptures entitled The Invisible Obvious, takes ocean plastic as both its material and its subject. Before I met him, I was participating in beach cleanups and beginning to think about how to include salvage plastic trash in my sculpture. Since meeting the captain, my mind is totally in the gutter, looking for <laughs> straws, lids, nets, rope, and other salvage trash in the streets, on beaches, and everywhere I go. So thanks, Captain Moore, for making me a terrible person <laughs> to go for an uninterrupted walk with and for all that you are doing for the love of our oceans. It is now my great honor to welcome Captain Charles Moore. 
Oh, thank you, Blue. That was sweet. Appreciate it. Uh, shall I go ahead and share my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, um, so uh, as uh, Blue pointed out, um, originally uh, I started uh, my um, work in non the nonprofit sphere. Uh, it actually was in uh, 1994 that I started Al Goleta Marine Research Foundation. Same time, I also started Long Beach Organic, which took uh, vacant lots in Long Beach and turned them into community gardens. I'm, I'm from, the, from Long Beach. I'm from the east side, Long Beach. Um, and uh, uh, Alcalita became, uh, it really didn't start in 1994 as a plastic research organization. It was more uh, having to do with beach closures and bacterial contamination. And our focus changed when I discovered the Great Pacific Garbage Patch in, in 1997 and went back and sampled it in 1999. So this slide, this introductory slide you're seeing here is like from 10 years ago. And uh, uh, the, the sentiment is still the same. It's a problem that is rapidly worsening and, and has no simple solution. And we're on a mission to, uh, slow down that worsening of the problem. But uh, history is against us because the petroleum industry that makes plastic has uh, now been uh, throttled back because of electrification of transportation and uh, is pushing uh, all the stops to get more plastic into production in order to use the, the reserves of petroleum that they've built up over the years. So. Uh, it's now incumbent upon us to, to um, realize that the consequence of having this plastic waste is small nanoplastics and microplastics. So uh, I've begun a new organization. Algolita wasn't really equipped to get down to the nanoscale. It requires fancy uh, microscopic equipment, spectroscopic equipment. And, uh, and our focus initially can't be uh, so much on education as it was with Algolita. It's more on the research phase. So this is our uh, our new location, luckily right next to uh, Algolita, which is located in Long Beach near the mouth of the San Gabriel River and Alamitos Bay Landing. So we're right there next to our parent organization and we're still joined at the hip. We still work with Algolita and do a lot of activities uh, involving citizen scientists. But uh, this is uh, something new now that, that we've started. And I'm going to get into the presentation by going completely into outer space. Um, you know, um, the hubris that our species has for its ability to um, manipulate and control nature and accomplish amazing technological feats uh, without thinking about the side effects or uh, what are actually not effects that are on the side, they're direct effects of our technological prowess. It leads to situations like waste. Uh, if we can do things that are so fantastic and unbelievable. If a little waste is created, so what? But it turns out now that we've created so much waste that not having the forethought to deal with it is starting to have serious consequences. Uh, <clears throat> now here, we're looking at some waste uh, circulating around the earth and some explanations about what it is. Uh, a lot of it is uh, uh, paint chips and stuff that's come off of satellites. There's uh, satellites that have been exploded. There's actually frozen bags of sewage uh, that have been thrown out of spaceships uh, uh, just to get rid of uh, the uh, 
human waste. Uh, now, uh, 21,000 of these waste objects are being tracked, but there's really about a trillion of them out there if you consider the paint chips. And these things are going really, really fast. These things are orbiting the earth at tremendous speed. And what can happen is that uh, a scientist, and, and this was in 1978 that uh, Kessler predicted this, uh, that because of the, the quantity of space junk that there is now, the density of it, and it's in low earth orbit, a lot of it, uh, a single collision, you know, and one collision, you know, a, a thing has tremendous energy when it's moving very fast. So even a very small object, when it hits another object at a very high speed can be tremendously destructive. And a single collision could turn into a cascade that would make launching satellites difficult, if not impossible. Right now, uh, satellites do have to change course. We, a recent uh, resupply mission to the space station had to change course to avoid uh, plastic debris. Uh, a lot of it is plastic, metal, plastic. Paint chips are a type of plastic. But it's going to make carrying out space activities dis difficult, if not impossible, if this uh, continues. And so um, there is a kind of uh, consequence to development in which the trajectory that is desired leads to consequences that are not desired. There's a kind of a negativity to progress that needs to be taken into account. And uh, if we think about that time frame in the 70s, that's when uh, we started to have plastic shopping bags. We started to have a lot of new plastic. And uh, the consequence of plastic in our daily lives, not having take back infrastructure, not having some place to go uh, after it's through with its useful life, not having the ability to be reincarnated, creates a kind of similar situation in the ocean as we see in outer space where that all these things break down. They don't, plastic doesn't biodegrade. The, the plastic in earth orbit can be there longer than radioactive waste. Uh, you know, uh, the half-life of radioactive waste will be shorter than the time it, uh, you know, for these plastics to go away in, in, the, in, in orbiting the earth. They, 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 there's no resistance to their orbit. There's no atmosphere to slow them down. So they can keep going for a long, long time. <clears throat> the, the plastics in the ocean break into bits, but they also keep going for a long time because the plastic polymers don't biodegrade. They're, they're kind of a permanent, uh, smaller and smaller and smaller part of our environment. So this is a sample. <clears throat> I'll show you later in the program how we collect these, but this is just like from one hectare of ocean surface. And this, none of these things are really identifiable except for that oyster space or that uh, black tube that from the uh, oyster uh, aquaculture fishery. Uh, but really what you're seeing, and I think there's a wheel there, it's a, from a toy, but there's a lot of unidentified scraps. And <clears throat> this is what we're now analyzing. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of how we analyze that in our laboratory. We take these samples and, and oh, and by the way, um, before we get to the laboratory part, since this is a craft lecture, I wanted to tell you that the, I did craft this vessel. This vessel was built from scratch. Uh, it was built in Hobart, Tasmania, <coughs> launched in November of 1995. And uh, it's an accident that it found the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. That wasn't its original mission. But after finding it and going back there several times, uh, we realized that it's a very dangerous place to be. These buoys that you see here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this is a big, heavy, solid black buoy. It's not something you inflate. This is a solid, heavy duty fishing buoy. That's what these are. All these buoys here, that's actually a hard hat with a bunch of barnacles growing out of it. Um, 
<clears throat> these things go under what's the, the 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 deck of the vessel between the two hulls. It's a catamaran, and, and and when there's waves smashing those heavy buoys into the hull, they break it. So I declared in 2010, after having going back there a few times, that it was just too dangerous that we were breaking holes into the boat with all this trash out there. Not only that, these nets, these ghost nets, they call them, because they continue fishing after uh, the fisherman has uh, been long gone. These ghost nets get fouled around the prop. So what ends up happening is this is this is an example of what I would have to dive over in the middle of the night, take a serrated kitchen knife, and go in there and and chop that away from our propeller. So that would stop us dead in our tracks. It's dangerous, uh, hard on the drive shaft, hard on the engine. And then the hull getting punctured by all this waste. I said, I'm not going out there without serious modifications to this vessel. And so uh, we hauled it out uh, down in San Diego at Dr Driscoll Boatworks and uh, put in what they call nacelles. These are V-shaped uh, kind of wave breakers that, uh, go on underneath the what's called the wet deck of the vessel. And this would allow things to hit it without puncturing holes in the vessel. And then to prevent the tangling of the propeller, uh, we fabricated um, cages around the props. Uh, fishing vessels that deploy nets, purse seiners have these kind of cages around the props on the vessels that drag the, drag the nets around into the purse shape that uh, catches the fish. So we, we've modified the vessel to get uh, it into uh, a, a shape that would allow us to go back to the gyre and continue working uh, because millions of dollars in damage occurs every year to vessels because of trash. It doesn't, it, it's killing marine life, it, it damaging uh, the, uh, so much of our planet's uh, environment. But at the same time, it's also ruining um, uh, ships uh, and, and blocking intakes and, and causing severe damage uh, when engines overheat. So there's a lot to this uh, trash. So anyway, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, how we got to this point to where we've got all those little plastic bits and all that trash I showed you in in the middle of the garbage patch there with the neon light bulb and the hard hat and all the buoys and nets. Um, we wouldn't have seen that uh, in the era before World War II. As a matter of fact, during World War II, if you walked into a post office here, just about anywhere in the United States, you would have seen a poster like this that said, raise and share food. I've highlighted the part, walk and carry packages, conserve everything you have. This was what we call the ethos or the ethical uh, standard that people adopted. Uh, and, and, and since the Great Depression uh, really had that, that in mind, uh, you know, that was the world of my parents. That uh, was where they lived. Now I'm, um, I'm an East Side Long Beach guy. Uh, Long Beach has a, a history of being very, uh, uh, big in the development of rap music, uh, Snoop Dogg, The Twins, Warren G. So I'm trying to think about how we could change from this. And there's just 11 words that uh, from a song on an album that uh, Warren G and The Twins did uh, that I wanna play for you that encapsulates how things can change so rapidly. Just 11 words. that. that going to be a little lead up to it. These uh, rappers were worried about being co-opted by Hollywood. So the first part of the music you'll hear will be about uh, being about to get paid, but never going to Hollywood. So let me go ahead and play play this for you and stop it. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about what happened after World War II. So that's 11 words. I used to be that way, but now I'm like this. What is this way? So I used to be that way, but now I'm like this. 
this is the way we are after World War II. It's a whole new world. This was not the ethos of the Great Depression and World War II. We used to be that way, where we conserved everything we had. We walked and carried packages. We raised and shared food. But now we throw it away. We throw stuff away. <laughs> Life magazine, you know, this was before TV, really. People, everybody didn't have a TV in 1955. Uh, you got your information about what, what the haps were from magazines like Life Magazine. And this was a cover photo in Life Magazine by Peter Stackpole in 1955 called Throwaway Living. And uh, it was presaged by the uh, aluminum can, the throwaway can. Drink right from the can, no empties to return. It came in the late 40s. Uh, this would have been unthinkable uh, during during the wartime, but afterwards the the production had ramped up to such an extent that you know it's like what are we going to do with all this vaccine manufacturing capability when we've conquered the virus? They're still going to they're probably going to try to make a bunch of new things to shoot you up with with a needle. Well, that's what happened after World War II. We had all these factories making war materials. And, and, and having to adapt plastics because uh, natural fibers were cut off. The, the sisal was cut off, the, the uh, manila fiber, uh, the um, Philippine banana, the abaca made uh, uh, the uh, manila fiber. So uh, it was cut off and we, we changed to nylon. And, and, and we had so we had all these factories making all this stuff uh, for the war effort, and then uh, they had all this capacity, and so the peace dividend was this, and that just shows you how quickly we can change our lives. The, the the thesis of this article was the housewife would be more efficient if she didn't have to spend time washing and putting away the dishes, and we get the idea that this waste, this waste lifestyle saves time that's so you can you can be busy doing other things you don't want to be busy washing the dishes and now that's part of our modern lifestyle so it was a women's lib article this was how the wife would be liberated to spend more time with her family more time for herself more time with the kids uh by adopting the throwaway lifestyle it was convenient it used once and toss why don't feel guilty? Don't don't let that those feelings from uh, the war era and 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 the folks that suffered during the Great Depression make you feel guilty. Uh, and and the first throwaways were not uh, plastic; they were mostly paper, wood, and aluminum. But now the throwaways are are mostly plastic. So scientists have decided they wanted to know just how much was out there in the ocean. Uh, and we've contributed to that with our studies, but I know it's always going to be an underestimate. <clears throat> but the interesting thing you see here is uh, that the total plastic waste up here is greater than the global plastic production. So it adds up. The, the, the stuff just gets thrown away more and more each year. It, it doesn't last. So you're producing this huge amount but it's not them, but it's even more that's becoming waste. And out of that waste, uh, they consider uh, improperly disposed of plastics that doesn't get burnt or put in a landfill or recycled. They made a calculation and came up with, you know, an average of 8 million tons, but that was in 2010. It's gone up since then. People keep using this figure over and over again as if it was static, but it's not. It's going up, and uh, I think it's going up substantially. But it's also, these uh, figures were based on these trawls that are a third of a millimeter mesh net. You know, So it's not the nanoscale plastics they're counting here. They're counting plastics that are in the visible class. So why is it that we can't, you know, we don't have, um, why is it that we can recycle glass, 
We can recycle aluminum. There's money in it. There's a market for it. We can recycle paper even uh, pretty extensively. But plastic, not hardly at all. And I think a lot of it has to do with the melting point. You, you drive off, when you melt an aluminum can, all that paint and all that uh, beer and soda residue uh, is vaporized. And you get pure aluminum, which is cheaper than uh, you know, refining it from the mineral bauxite, which is where aluminum comes from. So there's a good market for recycled aluminum. You get a good price for saving your aluminum cans. Same thing with glass, you get high temperatures, steel, high temperatures. You get a pure product, but with plastic, you don't even kill the bacteria. You know, there are plenty of bacteria that can live in boiling water. And uh, it starts, plastic starts to melt right around the temperature of boiling water. So you don't get a pure material with the same characteristics as the original material when you try to recycle plastic. You get it contaminated with uh, things that you don't want. Plus you have kind of degraded that backbone of the plastic. The, the synthetic polymer has a carbon backbone and it gets cross-linked, it gets uh, degraded uh, with remelting and reuse. And so all recycled plastics, virtually all of it, has a lot of virgin material added in to keep the desirable characteristics of the plastic as part of the, as part of the substrate. So we end up with industry-sponsored uh, illusion that recyclability is there, it's available, it's possible, and it's being done. But the truth of the matter is, it's a lot of pretend to recycle. Uh, so much after the, the Chinese closed down our effort to send our toxics abroad, uh, so much of what is in that recycling bin, wh wherever you live, is going to go to a landfill or it's going to be burned. It's only pretending to be recycled. When you, you and, and we put a lot of effort into that. We work hard to try to recycle stuff uh, in our own lives. And, we, and, and, and you need a college education. You need, you need training to be able to distinguish between the different types of materials to be a good recycler because it really isn't simple to know <coughs> what is possible to recycle. So let's talk about the fact that recycling is an illusion. And therefore, when we send this stuff abroad to be recycled, and now that China won't take it, we're sending it to Malaysia, and <clears throat> Indonesia, and Vietnam, and it's ending up in their rivers because they can't recycle it either. And their rivers flow into the ocean. And, and it's very hard to know where this stuff is going. It, uh, plastic pollution that enters the ocean is very hard to follow. The, the stuff in Earth orbit is fairly static. Like I say, there's nothing pushing it out of the way unless it collides with another piece of debris. But the ocean is extremely dynamic. Uh, things are always moving. And so tracking ocean debris is a difficult uh, job. However, Scientists have done it using buoys. They've let thousands of buoys loose uh, from the coast around uh, the world. And this uh, visual shows you if you were to release these buoys that the scientists have put out uh, in the ocean <coughs> equally from the coasts of the world, this is how they would migrate around the ocean. This is a 10 year uh, experiment in which uh, the buoys are released at a constant rate. Uh, they they uh, flow into the ocean uh, equally. It's, it's not, this doesn't uh, take into account that, you know, urban centers produce more than rural areas. It just lets them equally, but it, it ends up showing you where plastics accumulate in the ocean. And where plastics accumulate in the ocean are in the five gyres. So you can see them starting to form here. The, the, the lighter colors, the yellows, the orange, and the reds are uh, 
higher concentrations of debris. <clears throat> you see the Indian Ocean uh, gyre starting to form here. The South Pacific uh, gyre starting to form here, the South Atlantic, North Atlantic, and the biggest and uh, most populated one, and, and basically the one where the others eventually end up because these areas are connected by uh, currents that travel the whole ocean and they kind of decay in the North Pacific. So the North Pacific really is the heaviest uh, of all the gyres in terms of plastic pollution. And what it looks like, I won't let this go till the end, but what it looks like if you do let it go to the end is this. These are the five gyres. Uh, the Indian Ocean here, <clears throat> the North Pacific, the South Pacific, the South Atlantic, and the North Atlantic. And uh, we work with uh, Maxim, Menko, and Hefner, and they provide us now, they're able to give us historical maps of where we were when we did this sampling out in these garbage patches. This little black box, you can see a kind of a V that looks sort of like a, a boomerang in there. That's our 11 stations, uh, uh, half of them in an east-west direction, and half of them in a north-south direction. That was our original uh, study in 1999. And you can see that here, also the red color is uh, highest concentration. In 1999 here, we were right on the edge of it. We, uh, we found six uh, kilos of plastic for every kilo of plankton. We weren't really in the center of the garbage patch. And it moves too. You can see it's much closer to Hawaii here and here it's uh, much closer to um, the coast of California. So uh, we have to take into account this modeling uh, when we study uh, plastic in the ocean, but uh, it's nice now because these scientists can guide us uh, in real time to where they think the highest concentrations are and we can sample there. So that's something we've been doing in our most recent voyages. The way we work out there this is floating plastic. There, there's been studies now that show that uh, it does eventually sink. <coughs> and most of the plastic uh, in the ocean is on the bottom of the ocean, but there's still very high concentrations on the surface. And this is how we sample the surface. And this, a lot of the surface plastics will become uh, bottom plastics. This is the manta trawl. It's like a manta ray. It has a wide mouth and wings on it. It, it drags this net this collection bag the third of a millimeter mesh and this is what the sample looks like when we we bring it up out of the ocean this is about one hectare of ocean surface which is pretty amazing to think that all of that is in there millions of millions of particles if uh, you know uh, in in a, a rather confined area of the uh, pacific ocean but when they say it's confined, it's confined by the currents, but the actual area is, is enormous. Uh, it's been compared to twice the size of Texas. I don't think any scientist would uh, choose uh, the outline of Texas as a unit of measurement because it's a very strange shape. But uh, that's what people like to, in Europe, they say it's twice the size of Western Europe and you know, uh, different uh, geographical areas like to compare it to their own geography. But the point is that uh, where this kind of concentration exists is in a, an area as big as a continent. <clears throat> so it may be somewhat confined, but not, not actually, um, not actually uh, uh, a small area. It's not, it's not something that can be cleaned up. The, the idea that uh, Boyan Slat had that he was gonna go out there with a uh, sewer pipe and uh, do the ocean cleanup and had a lot of fanfare and probably many of you have heard about that. It was a complete failure. It didn't work. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the booms that he put out there were weighed tons. Uh, they were made of polyethylene. They were basically polyethylene sewer pipe and they uh, ended up uh, breaking and they failed and he had to tow them back in. And now he's focusing on the mouths of rivers, which I told him when he first came to me, you know, a decade ago and said he wanted to do this. I said, you'd really be better served working at the mouths of rivers. That's really the last chance for capturing this stuff. 
it's too widely dispersed out there. When it's the size of a continent, you're not going to be able to create a, a boom structure that's going to co collect it, although he made the case that he could. But, but he has failed, and now he's, he's focusing on, on the rivers. So we take those samples to the laboratory, and, and we first sort them by size. We put them through sieves. And the, the point I want to make here is that, uh, you know, if you think about this vial here that has a one to, uh, one to uh, three millimeter um, size class, uh, you would expect if that's going to be breaking down, as I said, it doesn't biodegrade, it just gets smaller and smaller, that you would have uh, lots more of these small particles, but you don't. <laughs> so that's the point about invasion of the biosphere. These things get taken up, they get consumed, they become part of uh, the environment. And I'll, ex I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. We also do it by type of plastic. This is uh, fragments here, uh, line, thin plastic films, which would be packaging, which is uh, uh, what, uh, and our first study was the most common type of uh, identifiable plastic uh, was the packaging, the thin plastic films. And these are the, the plastic resin beads, the nurdles, that, they're from the factories. The factories are very sloppy with how they handle these plastics and a lot of them escape into the environment. These little pellets we, uh, have been come to be called nurdles. And then you don't see out in the deep ocean, you don't see a lot of foam because polystyrene, uh, which you know we know as styrofoam, uh, is expanded uh, by air. And when those cell walls break, the, the actual polystyrene plastic uh, is heavier than water, so it sinks. So uh, the styrofoam that is so common on the beaches and is probably the most common plastic we see in the coastal zone is very rare out in the middle of the ocean. So um, uh, that's that's a, a but that probably what that means is that it's throughout the water column. Uh, we have tremendous amounts of styrofoam leaving the coast, uh, but as it breaks down, then it starts to populate the entire water column. So it's very pernicious in that sense and that it gets into everything out there. And that's what this plastic is doing. It's getting into everything. It's getting into our recreational activities. This is a surfer surfing <coughs> in Indonesia. And this is a powerful message. This was pushed a lot, this photo by Surf Rider. You can see uh, it, it's ruining the aesthetics. This is the, the green room. This is the place where most surfers wanna be. I'm a surfer, I would love to be inside that room in, encapsulated by mother ocean. It's just the greatest feeling and the greatest experience and, and also the, the most highly prized ride in a surfer's life is to be in this position. But it's ruined to my way of thinking by trash. Uh, however, is that image art? Is it, uh, is it art? It's a photograph, it's reality, but I think an artistic rendering can be even more powerful. And this is an artistic, uh, and, and before I show you the other, the other image, uh, let's just talk about what is, why art is different than a photograph like that. Because uh, that photograph is real, it's not fictitious. <clears throat> And art creates a, a fictitious world, which is nevertheless more real than reality itself. So I think this image here is more real than reality itself. This is art. This is uh, an image that creates a, um, consciousness in a person viewing it that there is a, a disaster occurring, a child is peeking into the ocean and seeing a disastrous plastic polluted ocean. 
And this is truly a work of art. And it's a work of art that has a strong message. Uh, the message is that the status quo is intolerable. You can't just lift up the ocean and have this be the way it is. This is a travesty. And I think that's what art can do. It can create that, that break with the status quo that says that it's intolerable. <clears throat> so here we're looking at what's in the Great Lakes. This is taken a uh, sample by my colleague, Marcus Erickson. And uh, it's got a lot of microbeads in it. And uh, one doesn't usually think of uh, Illinois uh, being uh, the leader in uh, environmental regulation, but they were one of the first to ban microbeads when he produced this study that showed all these microbeads from cosmetics and toothpaste ending up in the Great Lakes. Uh, they will continue to break down. These things will continue to break down and they'll become smaller and smaller particles. So that's the subject of my talk today. That uh, because of their tenacity, their ability to survive, their ability to just keep on keeping on, these plastics have now become a threat uh, at every level of the biosphere. Uh, as Louis Pasteur said, the role of the infinitely small is infinitely large. And, you know, he was a creator of, of vaccines to prevent disease caused by germs. This is, this is the, the guy that we can thank for the concept of being able to vaccinate ourselves against COVID-19. And yet that world, that microbiological world is now in being invaded by a synthetic polymer that offers no benefit to that world. That world is being invaded by an alien substance which can only harm it. There, I can't envision any scenario in which synthetic polymers invading the biosphere improve the biosphere. So we're starting to see it in these little animals. The salp is the vacuum cleaner of the ocean. It can uh, it's, uh, process half of the water column that it inhabits every day. And <clears throat> it takes in this plastic. It's just a hollow tube. It's a chordate jelly. You can kind of see it's a precursor to vertebrates. It's got a backbone, kind of these, these circles that you see there and they, they flex and they can uh, pulse water through this hollow tube and it collects whatever goes into that tube. Over eons of time, it's evolved to be that uh, object that is capable of vacuuming up anything that's there because historically it was biodegradable. It was something that could be consumed and used as food energy. Now we're filling things up with uh, non-digestible, non-nutritive nanoplastics. And here we have uh, below, below, these are very common. These are by the wind sailor. It's a sailing jellyfish. That's Christiana Borger who did the study we're about to see of <clears throat> uh, lanternfish. She's holding one that we see thousands and thousands of them out in the garbage patch. And what happens to these guys as they float along is they bump in, they have a very gelatinous deck. That's a sailboat. The blue part is the deck of the sailboat. Uh, the, the clear part is the sail. And as they sail along, they bump into these bits of plastic and they stick to the gelatinous deck of the sailing jellyfish and they become embedded in its tissue. So we're actually creating plastic jellyfish with our trash. Uh, kind of amazing to think about that. Uh, it doesn't take a very big piece to kill a baby sea turtle. These gyres, these five gyres that I showed you are where sea turtles go to grow up because they're oceanic deserts. They don't have the big predators, the big fish, the big sharks. They can eat these little zooplankton and jellyfish there and grow to be big enough to resist attack from uh, predators. And then they can go lay eggs on some beach. <clears throat> but a tiny little piece of plastic can block the pylorus and, and kill one of these baby turtles. And just think about how challenging it is to grow up in the garbage patches of the ocean uh, if you're a baby turtle. 
Now, the fish you're seeing here are the most common vertebrate on the planet. Uh, they're the lanternfish. It's the fish you've never heard of. It turns out to be about 50% of all fish biomass are these Mctophidae, the lanternfish. They are tremendously common fish, but they're not a schooling fish, so you can't harvest them like anchovies. <coughs> they're uh, fairly solitary. They live about a mile deep and then come to the surface to feed at night. And what we did was we collected a bunch of them and we looked at them for plastics. We opened up their stomachs and we started finding plastic inside of them. Now they have a big mouth there, you can see uh, here. When that's open, it's all the way back. There's the, the angle of the jaw. So a piece of plastic like that can fit in, but it'll never get it out the other end. It's stuck in there. So what you're gonna have is uh, a situation where the natural food, which is on the left, is being displaced by the synthetic polymers on the right. And uh, that's a serious issue because the lanternfish, being the most common vertebrate on the planet, being uh, the base of the food chain for the salmon that we like, for the swordfish that we like, for the tunas that we like, that along with squid, the lanternfish are the main food source for the fish that we consume. And if we, the, these are floating plastics. These, these have not been fouled enough to sink down to the bottom. These are things that it collected at night on the surface, darting frantically around, because as soon as the sun starts to come up, they dive down, they have to hide. The reason they're so successful, there's so many of them, is because they live in darkness most of their life. They only come for a brief period at night to feed on the surface. And so they're accident prone to get these plastics. And, and these plastics then become like life preservers inside of them. So they're providing resistance. They have to swim a mile down after the sun starts to come up. They're being pushed back to the surface by these plastics and they're limited in their nutrition to overcome that resistance because they haven't eaten a full meal. They've been, half of their meal has been trashed. So if that uh, species collapses, that has very serious consequences for the food chain in the ocean. I mean, that's the record holder there. It had like 84 pieces of plastic, I think, inside of it. Um, and it, there's a fish as big as your middle finger. This is a very small fish, but it's the base of the food chain. Very worrisome. And I just talked to a scientist that uh, we worked with to study the hormones of these fish. And he found out that uh, the fish in the garbage patch the mctophas in the garbage patch are have much higher stress levels in their hormonal uh, profile than uh, lanternfish outside the garbage patch. So it is having an effect on them. It is uh, putting them under stress. How much stress can they take? We don't know. We do know that the longer these things take out at sea, the more polluted they get. Uh, the color changes to a orange from a white and not only do they absorb pollutants and transmit them to the things that eat them, uh, they, uh, at time of manufacture, often have pollutants added to them as conditioners for the plastic. So they can transmit uh, pollutants both from the factory and from the stuff they absorb floating around out at the ocean. So let's talk a little bit about science because we always think about science as the solution. We're going to have scientific technological breakthroughs that are going to free us from the atmospheric consequences of global warming, climate change, carbon pollution. We're going to have scientific breakthroughs that allow us to have more leisure time that are going to uh, take away the need for us to be behind the wheel of the car. Uh, but we have to admit it was science that gave us plastic. It was science that told us, that gave us the internal combustion engine. It was science that caused the problems that we're, that we're asking science to fix. So I believe it was Einstein that said, you can't fix a problem with the same consciousness with which you created it. And that is what is needed. And that's why art is so important because really what science seeks to do is to control, is to dominate both human beings and nature. And 
we have to realize that we can't continue to do that without having these externalities overtake us and cause us to uh, go backwards while we're going forwards. So artists like Banksy, they can inspire radical change, but you know, really all authentic art subverts the dystopian present and cries out for liberation. It is uh, the work of the artist to be other than the status quo and to offer reflection. You know, um, art requires an inwardness, uh, also known as subjectivity. Uh, and that has been taken away to a large degree by social media. You get instant feedback. And that stifles the development of meaning and the development of your subjectivity and your consciousness, your awareness. So I'm sort of becoming the enemy of efficiency. I'm, 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 I'm not in favor of speed up. I'm not in favor of the 24 seven lifestyle. Uh, I'm in favor of the guaranteed annual income and a little space to create because truly the potential we have to liberate this planet is there. Technology has provided it, but uh, using it for domination of nature and for other human beings in wars, uh, really pointless wars, uh, for domination and, and truly uh, experimenting to make sure that you have the best weaponry uh, so that you can claim to your population that they're safe from that kind of weaponry being used against them. That kind of thinking won't get us out of the mess we're in. We're going to have to have artists break the repressive reality. So uh, I try to be uh, an artistic captain. Uh, when we crossed the equator uh, in 2017, after studying the South Pacific garbage patch, I took the polywogs and turned them into shellbacks in a ritual, an old sailor's ritual. And on the right there, you see, uh, a cusk eel inside a Vaseline jar uh, that was trawled up right here off, uh, off the coast, not uh, two miles from our office. Uh, and um, we returned the cusk eel to the ocean. It was alive, but it was trapped inside that Vaseline jar. So uh, I wanna uh, thank you for giving me the chance to talk to you about how, and here you see a salp on the final slide and the Moore Institute for Plastic Pollution Research that has invaded the biosphere, plastic has invaded the biosphere here in, in this animal. Uh, and uh, we're going to have to change as uh, a human family in order to combat plastic pollution because it is not point source pollution. We can't say that it comes from one place, one factory, uh, one source. We all, with our clothing now, with synthetic fibers, uh, they're the, the, the most common pollutant now is uh, polyester fibers from our clothing. Uh, it used to be that a, a volcanic island, when it uh, emerged in the Pacific or the Atlantic or the Indian Ocean, uh, would uh, have the first things be spiders because their webs would, uh, their silk web would have allowed it to to be wafted into the upper atmosphere and be carried by the jet stream and then precipitated out with the rain onto the island. Now it's synthetic polyester fibers that are first things to populate a new volcanic island. They've reached the upper atmosphere. So not only are we in the outer space, we're in the mid-range space at the upper atmosphere and we're at the bottom of the ocean. So we're everywhere and uh, we have a, we have to change radically to deal with that. It won't be a simple process and it may take a long time, but through forums like this and educational opportunities, we hope to be uh, part of that radical change that is gonna be uh, really one of, of love and uh, community uh, that is required uh, in, a, in a sharing economy. Uh, sharing is gonna be the key, not competition. Uh, anytime that you uh, share, uh, you are 
being part of the solution. So think about the sharing economy, think about uh, moving away from competition and think about cooperation. Cooperation is the key, not competition. So thanks for being uh, part of this uh, Zoom. I wish it was in person. I wish we could all be together be in the same room and be part of a community and, and hash this out. But uh, I'm happy to take any questions if we have time, if I haven't gone over. But thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much, Captain Moore. Um, it's overwhelming, startling, and there's just so much more to, to cover. Um, uh, I see people are willing to, to stay. We're gonna go a couple minutes over in terms of Q&A. Um, please stick around if you're interested and add any questions in a Q&A for us um, or the chat if you prefer. Um, I just wanted to start by asking your thoughts about the pandemic and the new proliferation of plastics um, from PPP yeah. to shipping and- uh, it, just, it, it just goes to show you <clears throat> our hubris. We, we create a huge new throwaway product chain, a single use throwaway product chain, and you don't hear one PSA one public service announcement saying, you know what? You are, our world is now going to be inundated with masks, gloves, smocks, and throwaway materials made mostly from polyester that uh, are going to contaminate the entire planet. And unless we very carefully uh, put them into a, some kind of a, a an infrastructure that will take them back and reuse them, or at least dispose of them properly, we're going to have a huge load of disposable waste, medical waste all over. And that's what we're seeing in every parking lot, every beach. And, and yet, no government official, I have not heard of anyone in any position of authority, speak up and say, you need to be very careful with these materials. It's very dangerous when they get into the environment. They break down into these nanoparticles. They poison us and the environment. We're breathing and consuming through the water uh, a credit card size uh, amount of plastic every week or so. So uh, it's not, uh, as I said in the presentation, I can't see anything good coming from that. And for no one to acknowledge that, no one in any position of authority to acknowledge that just goes to show you how little uh, this issue is understood by uh, the powers that be. So um, the big question of what can be done, is there any policy that we can all support, any more finite action? And one of the questions that's come up is, even the smallest steps, what, what are the smallest steps that we can start with? Well, you can certainly uh, uh, become part of the political uh, movement to limit plastic waste and plastic pollution. And that's uh, uh, my congressman, you know, who I've been you know, <clears throat> lobbying. I knew him since he was a city councilman here in Long Beach, Alan Lowenthal is now in uh, the US Congress has introduced the break free from plastic bill. And, uh, you know, he's uh, heard our message because I've repeated it to him on so many occasions. He's actually a friend. Uh, and, uh, you know, I knew him when, before he got into politics or as he was uh, you know, running for his first city council seat here in Long Beach. And uh, you can support the break free from plastic bill that is coming before Congress. That's the political sphere. Now in your personal life, uh, you can just say no to uh, throwaways. Uh, we, if you visit our shop here in Long Beach, the Bring Your Own store, uh, you get refillables. Uh, I, I take, uh, I like the Castile soap. I take my refillable bottle and, and get them to refill my Castile soap so I don't have to get a new bottle every time I, I buy Castile soap. Yeah. Uh, we want to try a lot of these products um, are substitutes for things that were formerly reusable. 
Uh, and so we're going back now. When I showed you that picture of uh, walk and carry packages, you know, uh, conserve everything you have and, and, and showed you, you know, how you people were encouraged to throw away things, that's being reversed in our personal lifestyles now. We've come to see that that's not liberating, that doesn't give us more freedom, that it actually restricts us. And so we find our freedom in minimizing our product load, you might say, in our lives and having those essential products be reusable and, and put in refillable containers and, and have non-plastic uh, uh, substitutes for things that had come to be thought of as made out of plastic. Yeah, I was interested to see that you're involved with that. And that's just local in Long Beach. I, I mean, do you see bigger efforts like that, more companies opening along those lines with refillables and? Oh yeah, it's not just in Long Beach. There's the naked produce stores, you know, uh, we don't need an orange wrapped in plastic. It has its own wrapper. We don't need a banana wrapped in plastic. Don't need a pineapple wrapped in plastic. Naked produce uh, is, is the key. Uh, stores are popping up, farmers markets for to a large degree. Many of them have stopped using plastic bags. <clears throat> so yeah, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a movement, it's happening. And it's not uh, just in Long Beach. I've seen it in, in London. Uh, the movie Trash, narrated by Jer Jeremy Irons, Academy Award winner that I'm in, uh, he uh, uh, shows a shop in, in London uh, that has, uh, you, you know, all uh, reusable uh, items and, and, and naked produce. So yeah, um, that, that's happening worldwide. Yeah, just needs a massive systemic change. Um, and thank you, Blue McBride is mentioning fabric face cup coverings versus surgical masks um, as, as alternatives. Um, thank just you. make sure the fabrics are not synthetic fabrics. <laughs> yes, which is a whole other topic, but um, yeah, we didn't have enough time. I don't know if you want to briefly mention um, anything on that front, synthetic fabrics, synthetic well, guides. Uh, we're working with uh, Cyclo. Uh, it's a company that wants to make uh, degradable fabrics. And uh, I've gotten some water samples for them so they could test their fabrics, make sure they degrade in, in ocean water. I also work with uh, New Light Company. They make uh, a PHB straw and PHB cutlery. It's a kind of uh, marine degradable plastic. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are companies working on the fabric end and on the disposable end uh, to uh, you know, create things that if they're, they're not marine disposable, believe me, just because something's marine degradable doesn't mean it should be disposed of in the marine environment. The marine environment has already got too many nutrients in it from uh, runoff. But what we do want to see is uh, reusable items made from things that if they do escape, won't harm the environment. And that's what we're looking at uh, for the, the new fabrics, bamboo, hemp, uh, and the, the kind of synthetics that Cyclo is working on. And then the uh, cutlery, the PHB, the polyhydroxy uh, alkanoate, uh, and uh, its uh, cousin PHB, uh, th they've shown that their product degrades in the marine environment. I've done the studies with in cooperation with the army, they wanted to make their uh, 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 meals ready to eat, their MREs uh, in bags that you know were degradable so that they wouldn't pollute when they were left in the battlefield. So yeah, there's a lot of interest in that. It just requires a systemic change, as you said. It requires a change in mentality. It has to be adopted on a massive scale. That's why I'm waiting to see what will be the disaster that elevates plastic pollution to the level of climate change. As I pointed out, no PSAs about single use plastics during COVID. So it's obviously not at that level of concern, but there will be a crash. There will be a serious crash of our health. I, I believe uh, not only the environment, you know, creatures other than ourselves, but we ourselves will be affected by plastic in a negative way. And I can see going to the doctor in the not too distant future, and in addition to your blood work or as part of your blood work, uh, having uh, your uh, physician check you for your plastic content. 
I believe that's coming sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. um, Christopher Edwards asks, um, read in, he read in 2020 that the mass of human-made um, stuff has exceeded the entire global biomass and wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah, I've been saying that for years. I, I, I've started out saying uh, the weight of every man, woman, and child on earth is exceeded by just the annual production of plastic. Now, as your questioner uh, mentioned, uh, we could probably start to think about the entire biosphere uh, being exceeded by the amount of plastic. Uh, but we're certainly exceeding the weight of uh, the human species uh, with it. Um, okay, well, thank you. Yeah, we're getting a lot of comments in terms of echoing all of your thoughts. Um, I think we're all, you know, like-minded, preaching to the choir. Um, any closing, <laughs> closing remarks of um, finite, actionable steps that yeah. we can take, that well, artists I, can take? I, uh, I, I'm sure that the choir has lovely voices. <laughs> and uh, if the choir would just, you know, go out and sing to the general populace, I believe that that would be what's required. And, and when they hear that lovely voice singing, they're going to want to become part of the choir too. So as we continue to preach to the choir, let us hope that the choir grows exponentially. Beautiful. So incredibly inspiring. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to everyone who's attended today. This recording will be archived on um, CrouchinAmerica.org and on YouTube um, and Facebook as well. Thank you and so much. I believe we're going to have a link too to my Al Jazeera interview, which encapsulates this whole uh, issue pretty well in six minutes. So I have also have a six minute TED talk that encapsulates it pretty good too. Yes, uh, for those of you who want more information on, um, on Captain Moore's, uh, his book, Plastic Ocean, all the appearances and lectures that he's given over, over the years, um, there's information on, on our website. Um, we'll provide more, so um, revisit the event page. Uh, and, and also feel free to email us with any questions. If you'd like to be in contact, we're happy to connect you as well. And can, I, can I tell them my personal website? Of course. It's captain charles moore.org. Great. Great. So please email us if, um, if you need more information about how to reach Captain Moore. Thank you again. Incredibly important conversation today. Um, great. Yeah. Great. Everyone. Yeah. Art, art is the key. We've got to, we've got to integrate art into the, all the solutions for the problems that face us.